Hello, and welcome to another campfire session presented by InCamp. I'm your host, Brandon Barlow, and we also have our CEO of InCamp, Luke Jacobs. Today, we will be speaking with Carla Gill. She is the Director of Remediation Services, and Tim Bannister. He's a Senior Project Manager at Sesco Group. So the topic of conversation today is the waste management of PFAS. PFAS has been a hot topic in the media um, and environmental industries for the last few years. Uh, the EPA has even come out and stated in January that they are aggressively addre addressing a PFAS action plan. So before we get started, could you both give yourselves a brief description and then um, a little bit about Sesco Group? Yeah, I'll, I'll get started. Um... My name is Lily Gill, and I'm currently the Director of Technical um, Operations in the Remediation Division of Sesco Group. Um, my background is uh, working with uh, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management as uh, different roles as a project manager in the state-led cleanup and also in their voluntary remediation program. I've been with Sesco about 15 years. Um, Sesco is a, um, works as an environmental consultant for clients that range everywhere from mom and pop gas stations to you know large industrial complex. We work on uh, pretty simple sites, just taking out some underground storage tanks, all the way up to um, you know EPA led uh, Superfund caliber sites. And then Tim, I'll let him talk. But he, uh, of course, does our solid waste work. Very good. Yeah, very good, Carla. Um, thank you. Our uh, particular specialty in our solid waste section, we work with a lot of different types of uh, waste landfills, sanitary landfills. But I also have a background in particular and uh, some of my colleagues in the waste area uh, background as hazardous waste as well. The, I've been working in the environmental field for more than 40 years now, and my specialty has always been focusing on groundwater issues mm. in respect to hazardous and solid waste. Um, a number of our colleagues, we, we started the, the solid waste section of uh, Sesco about five years ago, and so we... Uh, do quite a bit of work in the region, as well as in some other states a little more farther flung, uh, including California um, and Maryland, those other locations out around us. Um, um, so I'm just curious uh, to kind of tee you guys up a little bit. Uh, what would you say it, one of the uh, kind of differentiators, uh, you know, a client gets working with a group like Sesco compared to working with, uh, you know, Brandon and I have backgrounds in really large, you know, consulting orgs. Uh, you know, how, how do you think your clients kind of, uh, you know, get value from a group like Sesco? Um, I just, from my perspective, I think the dealing with a smaller company like Sesco Group, I think you're going to find a lot more individualized attention. Mm -hmm. uh, both I know in the remediation group that I am part of and also Tim's group um, that is, you know, the solid waste folks, they're going to get a lot of our individualized attention. They'll um, probably have a little bit more interaction with some of the upper management of Sesco and availability to do that. Then I would think that they would get in a, in a larger national company. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. I'd like to add too that I think one of the keys of our uh, work with the client relationships that we build with them. We work alongside mm -hmm. our clients. We don't simply just do the work, give it to the, back to them. We work side by side. We work together. Um, I know at least in the solid waste area, a number of us have worked with our clients for th several decades, literally. Mm, and I wow. know Carla, the, the same way in your group, you have a number of clients that you work with for quite a few years. We have. We're really fortunate where we've gathered that kind of trust, you know, with our clients, and it's really something we very much value. Perfect. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good, guys. Let's go ahead and kind of jump right into the topic of the day. So it's PFAS and waste management. So, so PFAS are 
chemicals known as the forever chemicals. Uh, this has become a major topic, like I mentioned earlier. So let's start from the very, very beginning. What are PFAS? Um, as far as P, I call it PFAS, P-F-A-S. Mm -hmm. and, and those are floor alkyl, alkyl substances. And it's actually a family of compounds. And there are more than 4,000 of these types of compounds, which are uh, fluorinated uh, long chain carbons. So they can be shorter chains, but the whole chain of carbons with fluorines attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a family of compounds. And within that family, there's been a focus quite a bit on what's called PFOS and PFOA. Um, and those are specific types of carbon chain compounds that uh, have really created some of the biggest problems uh, more recently and have been phased out. To help people kind of understand, uh, you know, how prevalent these may be, what are some kind of common items that PFAS are, you know, found in that just anyone would kind of... As we're with Teflon, uh, mm -hmm. used Teflon pans, Scotch guard for fabrics. Uh, later on, they were developed uh, for use in packaging, food packaging. Anybody who's had microwave popcorn about 20 years ago probably had PFAS uh, uh, compounds in their uh, uh, in their system. Um, Gore-Tex, uh, firefighting foams, uh, personal products, uh, cosmetics lotions, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's an extremely lot. wide range yeah, mm -hmm. of compounds. And I think that really presents the difficulty. The, uh, unlike a lot of other specialty chemicals, um, PFAS compounds are just found everywhere. So you've mentioned there are kind of these PFOAs and then PFOS, like PFOSs, uh, uh, and they're in this class of the, uh, you know, PFASs, the PFAS. So uh, you know, what are some of these differences and, you know, which are kind of the most harmful or are, are one of them more harmful, I guess, just how should people think about these, you know, kind of subclassifications within this group? Right. The PFO, PFOS and PFOA compounds were identified fairly early on as potentially presenting uh, some health issues. And so they had been voluntarily phased out and they are no longer used in the United States as of the early 2000s. Um, however, other uh, parts of the globe... Um, actually, yeah, Carla, do you want to, because I think this is really interesting, do you want to actually kind of recap with sampling? It sounds like, uh, you know, it, it, it's challenging to actually get, you know, clean samples and find places that can actually process those samples due to the possibility of cross-contamination. Uh, so, you know, could you talk to that a little bit? And then I think uh, really specifically, it's like the level of sensitivity that we're actually looking for these compounds at is a huge part of that challenge. Yeah, in my uh, career as an environmental scientist, uh, the PFAS is relatively new. It's something that we've uh, only analyzed for uh, in the last few years. And uh, it definitely represents a challenge when we go out uh, when we send a field person out to analyze or to collect our samples, um, they, there's a lot of cross-contamination concerns, um, so we don't want them. Our, part of our protocol is for them not to wear any Gore-Tex material, anything that's been weatherized with a, maybe a Scotch guard or, or boots that are weatherized um, because that type of material can contain uh, the PFAS um, compounds. Mm -hmm. um, we, at, we, one of my jobs, I even had a field tech that had a um, mustache that he liked to wax. Yeah, and yeah. I, had to tell no, him, I, I had to tell him, I'm like, Seth, you can't, you can't have the mustache wax uh, material because I'm sure that that would have, you know, some kind of PFAS in it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no lotion, cosmetics. So basically you're out there looking pretty raw and natural. That's the only way to, to, to collect the sample for the PFAS. And then the, you know, what we're throwing down into a well or into a, a in this case, one of my sampling jobs was a frack tank that contained some groundwater. Um, you know, we had to not use a Teflon coated baler. Um, Cause again, Teflon, yeah is sure. worse of PFAS. 
And um, yeah, and then to find a laboratory, um, I didn't find any laboratories in Indianapolis. I did, we do have a national laboratory in Indianapolis that had a uh, lab in Minnesota that had some experience with the analysis. So that's where the sample actually went. It's fairly expensive uh, mm -hmm. to do a sample for PFAS. And the, you know, the analysis that we're doing is down in the parts per trillion level. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a challenge. And then when you find it, it's like, what do you do? What yeah. happens then? Um, does and that the, leads to the regulation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does the frack mm -hmm. tank of groundwater now become hazardous? How is that disposed of? The wastewater treatment plants probably don't want to accept it after it, you know, has known to have PFAS. But um, so that's kind of the next hurdle after you after you find it. Well, what does that mean? What do you what do you do? Where do you go from there? So, right. absolutely. One one of the things as we keep talking about the PFAS or the PFAS um, non regulations and how we're kind of up in the air and how even labs are going to have to switch out, you know, Teflon materials and you guys are going to have to go out there and actually wear different PPE. I see dollar signs. So I know how much sampling costs already. So what does it cost to say, Hey, I want to, I want to sample for some of these, uh, PFAS chemicals, uh, in the trillions. How much does that cost? Um, just my experiences based on kind of maybe a more common analytical list, it's at least three to four times more expensive, uh, just the analytical costs. And some of the protocols and, and making sure we have the specialized equipment, um, it, it definitely adds up. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's not, not inexpensive to include PFAS in your constituent list. Absolutely. Yeah, and we, I, we mentioned this before, I think, but the uh, the field QA, QC samples that we have to take is even more critical. You know, the field mm -hmm. blanks and the trip blanks, um, the MS, MSDs, you know, those become really uh, especially critical for PFAS at those low concentrations. And we'll probably be looking at actually doing more. Generally, for example, field blanks are done one per every 20 samples, but uh, again, because of the sensitivity and the low concentrations, uh, it may be that it's advisable to do one every 10 samples. Mm -hmm. And of course, that adds to the cost as well. Um, you mentioned earlier the, the, the low concentrations that are required. And the reason is, is because the, right now there's sort of a patchwork of state regulations on, mm. uh, on these PFAS compounds. The health advisories have been uh, generally the US EPA says 70 parts per trillion. Um, other states, some states are setting it at 20 parts per trillion. So that's that's pretty incredibly low. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the concern is that, as Carla mentioned, we find it at, say, what if we find it at 75 parts per trillion? What are we supposed to do with that? Correct. Um, and again, because it varies from state, uh, there's no uh, the, the, the drinking water standard has not been set by the US EPA for that. It's just a health advisory level. In other words, they're concerned and there's some indications of these health problems, but they don't know enough detail to say this is going to be the maximum contaminant level mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. have drinking water. Um, so it, it's uh, things are changing fast. and. We just found out yesterday, uh, the US EPA, I think it was the US EPA, the um, uh, 173 of the PFAS chemicals have been put on the toxic uh, registry index. Uh, mm -hmm. that, which, what that means is any companies that deal with a certain level or a certain num number of pounds of these 173 chemicals, they need to report it. And they're going to be keeping a, a log of, of exactly who's using it, where, where it's being used, and how much over time. So that's kind of a, the next step in setting some of these regulations, but it's still a ways off, I think, for the final regulations. Mm -hmm. So Tim, th so this is kind of the first step in this whole process of figuring out what exactly we're gonna do. Um, what's next? So now it's on the registry list. What do you think is gonna happen next within, let's say the next year? Well, uh, I think 
you know, certainly the toxic studies are going to have to, to become uh, more sophisticated and more uh, detailed. They still are fairly early in the stages of that. A uh, number of the industries that actually manufactured these um, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they had inklings in themselves with their own internal work that they had certain problems that caused certain, mainly because of the industrial hygiene studies that they were doing with their own workers that, to deal directly with this. But the studies that we need now and that are being done uh, slowly but surely are on, uh, and I think Luke, you sort of touched on this earlier about the uh, chronic effects of yeah. low level that we're all exposed to all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and again, it's a repeat of a, what Carla mentioned before is that, you know, then the, the, the question becomes how much are we willing to accept? It, mm -hmm. Again, acceptable risk, which mm -hmm. we do, with, to be honest with you, we do with a lot of other compounds all mm -hmm. the time. We drive our cars, you know, with uh, gasoline that has benzene and toluene and xylene, and we, we tolerate a certain exposure to that. Mm -hmm. The again, though, the, the PFAS compounds, the sensitivity of it uh, down mm -hmm. the part per trillion range does present some challenges. And yeah, I was just going to mention that's interesting bringing up gas because I would say, uh, you know, that's actually a great example because we still have, you know, benzene but no longer lead in gas, for instance. And it's kind of a question, it almost seems like within, within PFAS, we know some concerning things about them. Like they, they are the forever chemicals. They appear to be able to bioaccumulate. We can find them everywhere. But then it does sound like a yeah, big unknown with where the regulations will go is that there actually isn't, you know, been time even for some of this, you know, ground level research that's ran over time. Because I would imagine a lot of the, uh, you, you kind of touched it on Tim, but a lot of the initial kind of warning signs were, were a lot higher dosage kind of yeah. uh, situations with the people actually manufacturing them. And so now right. it is on them. Like we know there's a, there's a point where too much is very clearly too much, but then yeah, yeah right. this part per trillion, it really is these tiny amounts, but, uh, but yeah, it seems like the concern is that they're all over the place really, you know, uh, I don't know if we were recording, but Tim, you mentioned they've been found on all seven continents, which that alone is, uh, you know, yeah, kind of a shocking, yeah. Yeah. you know, distribution. It is. And, um, you know, and again, some of the states are starting to put some more restrictions on some of these. The industries themselves, they voluntarily phased out PFO and PFOS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the US EPA really uh, wanted to obviously reduce those, but rather than use a regulatory club, they went to those manufacturers and said, hey, you know, how about you voluntarily take these off? And they did. And that mm -hmm. has had a very positive effect. Um, hopefully that could continue in the future. And um, I think sometimes we, we would be good if these manufacturers could get a little bit of a ahead of their own studies <laughs> <laughs> rather than finding out, you know, 30 years down the road that this stuff's not really very good for you and you should be putting it out there. Um, but um, and that, that brings up another issue. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, our, our landfill clients and the wastewater treatment plants um, and their the clients that they serve, the resident, the residents, they're wondering when the regulations determine what is acceptable, um, how are they going to pay for this? And yeah. it'll be passed on to the consumer um, in some way or another. And that comes back to that issue of uh, how much is an acceptable um, level in, in the economy of things. Uh, mm -hmm. and that could be very difficult. And so it's, uh, uh, you know, again, there may be already there are lawsuits against the manufacturers that have been in the last three years that have been, you know, millions upon millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars settlements. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, uh, that's a, it's an ugly thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. basically, that kind of level. But um, yeah, so a lot of unknowns and i would imagine uh yeah a lot of a lot of interesting stakeholders which is kind of uh this is sort of unique because there are so many uh you know kind of the community is very much affected all the way up to you know specific you know large manufacturers and kind of everyone in between this is i mean brandon we've talked about it but it's not every day that there's uh 
you know, kind of like environmental toxicology on the news as, uh, yeah. you know, a thing that's in, uh, you know, a hot button issue, but, but this one really is. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sure just in case we accidentally, you know, had technical difficulties and kind of missed how the wastewater treatment plants are handling the PFAS. So what are they, what are they thinking right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe they are really handling it too much. Again, yeah. I think they're really passing it through their systems. Uh, now, there are uh, examples. There's a wastewater treatment plant in a fairly small community in North Carolina that um, I heard described. And they decided to go at, uh, take a lead. And for their residents, they basically uh, up their, uh, their rates tremendously. I believe they spent $300 million on treatment capacity to try to handle the PFAS. Wow. Um, and this is for a community that's only maybe a, less than 100,000 people. And um, some people will say, oh, that's great. They're really ahead of things. But if you live in that community and you're having to pay those sewage treatment bills exactly. that are maybe 10 times what they used to be, um, maybe you might think it's not quite worth it. Um, so that's, that's some of the issues that the wastewater treatment plants in particular are facing, you know, uh, yes, they have some things they can do. They can do reverse osmosis, which is very energy intensive, and very expensive. They can do carbon uh, fil filtration, activated carbon to take it out. Again, though, that material then has to be disposed of because you're not destroying the PFAS chemicals. You're only taking it out of the water or the fluid and holding it in a different medium that has to been, then be disposed of properly. Um, Mm. So it, it, it's a challenge there for that for themselves as well. Um, another aspect, um, I hate to be so, so gloom and doom here. <laughs> I can think of so many examples of where there's a problem because uh, the wastewater treatment plants, they have a lot of biosolids they produce. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's then in turn used to uh, put on fields, you know, and for agriculture. And, and indeed, they have found... PFAS uh, tied back to biosolids in um, dairy milk. And there are been dairy farms that cannot sell their milk because it's, they've detected PFAS in it. And that's directly linked to some of the biosolids that, uh, that were put in the agricultural fields. Um, so uh, they're looking at that as well. So there has to be definitely a breakthrough, I think, in the treatment of, mm -hmm. of these PFAS compounds to find some way to break them down or some other kind of reagent. That, and again, if I had, uh, you know, my, my background was organic chemistry, especially in fluorinated compounds, um, I could be a rich man if I could come, <laughs> come up with some kind of a treatment process for breaking these things down. Yeah. Um, there are people working on it, there's no doubt, and furiously. Um, there is, uh, I won't mention a name, but there was a man that, um, I met who's working on treatment for remediation sites in Massachusetts. And I believe he has some fairly promising technologies. I don't know exactly the, uh, he didn't reveal a lot of what he was talking about, but he has gotten, received a US EPA grant um, to carry out some demonstration projects for it. So people are working on it furiously. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. this, you know, something will arrive, but it will take quite a bit of investment and effluent. Another thing that was interesting to, to uh, was one study determined that the amount of PFAS that was being discharged to wastewater treatment plants from sanitary landfills on a mass level was a, a very small percentage, um, less than 10% or less something on the order of 10 or 13%. Um, so that means that, you know, uh, 80 some odd percent, 87 percent of PFAS chemicals that the wastewater treatment plants were, were seeing work was coming from residential or mm. other industrial uh, sources. Yeah. Um, so, you know, then you got to start thinking, okay, when you wash your garments, uh, when you clean your uh, whatever, you know, your, your, um, your makeup areas or, or you, you clean your, uh, all the different uh, personal care products we use that goes down the drain. It's going to the wastewater treatment plant. Correct. And that has the PFAS chemicals in it. Um, so, uh, again, we're back to that same issue of, you know, uh, okay, what levels are we willing to, to work, uh, live with? 
you know, and what, what it's going to cost to, to um, get it reduced. Yeah, it, it just seems like we have a lot more uh, questions than we have answers right now. Uh, for like someone like Carla, that makes it really hard for someone trying to get rid of uh, a frack tank. You know, what do you what do you do if you've got, you know, groundwater and let's say it did hit for um, some PFAS chemicals? Are you supposed to go to another place of disposal? How, how do you handle that? So we're, we're kind of getting into the next level of what we do. Um, I know in camp, uh, we're going to be watching this closely as some of these chemicals might come. Um, and actually we need to be filed for tier two. So Luke, can you explain a little bit about how that kind of ties in and what we'll be doing uh, here at NCAMP? Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So one of our kind of core software competencies, uh, you know, is in automating the filing of tier two hazardous material inventory reports. And that's really based on the EPA's list of list determinations for their chemicals. Um, so yeah, it's something that we're, we're keeping tabs on because uh, basically, the list of lists, you know, it's a fairly comprehensive list that the EPA maintains of, you know, kind of their their defined hazardous chemicals. Uh, but obviously, it's not comprehensive, you know, especially when you do have these kind of emerging, you know, chemical families. And I think, yeah, PFAS and PFOS are, you know, they're they're definitely something our CHMMs are, you know, keeping up with reading about as well to make sure that we're you know, ahead of the eight ball for any of our, you know, clients as these changes keep, you know, really materializing. It's something where it's hard to predict the future, especially when, uh, you know, you're dealing with the legislative process. We're just keeping tabs on it. Right. Absolutely. So, so before we get off, I kind of wanted to ask you guys, so people are coming to you, your clients are coming to you. Um, do you know of any company, has anybody said anything publicly about, hey, this is how we're going to handle and dispose of PFAS chemicals? Um, not publicly. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I think That's internally, internally there, at least for our clients, there are many conversations and conferences, whole conferences devoted to that, um, about how are we going to deal with this? Uh, they're talking about the legalities, the, uh, uh, the influence on, on legislation, uh, from state to state, as well as US EPA, um, the, uh, how to handle it. Uh, again, most of our clients are solid waste clients, and so mm -hmm. they've got uh, to determine whether leachate can be accepted by wastewater treatment plants in many cases, and they have not faced that too much in Indiana. Uh, uh, Carla mm -hmm. said, I think one of the municipalities in Ohio, uh, they at least want to know, is it in there? And of course, wastewater treatment plants, they have the option to say, even if there's not a regulation on it, they can say, nope. I'm sorry, we don't want to take that. Correct. You have to send it somewhere else. Um, so our clients are particularly concerned about that because they need to deal with their leachate and get it out. And then some of the some of them do have their own reverse osmosis systems, and they are they are effectively probably taking it out anyway and not even aware of it. That's um, fair. Yeah. Mm. Perfect, guys. Well, I, I really appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Is, is there any kind of final statement, Carla, Tim, anything you guys want to say before we get off? Yeah, I think, you know, this is something that uh, as an emerging chemical that, you know, in our field that we're, we're all looking at, uh, we're all kind of just waiting and, and watching and, and trying to implement our best practices when it comes to, to dealing, sampling, and and also disposal of, of anything with the PFAS material. Right. Mm -hmm. so stay tuned. Absolutely. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. And if you have any uh, questions, you know, Carla is your resident expert, right? You're uh, staying on top of yep. it. <laughs> yep. I'll put you on that pedestal. Um, <laughs> there you go. A lot of other people. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Well, well, if you guys got any questions uh, for myself, Luke, uh, Tim, or Carla, go ahead and leave a comment or you can reach out to them uh, via LinkedIn. You can also reach out to them on sescogroup.com. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And if you have any questions for InCamp, uh, go ahead and go to InCamp.com. All right, guys. We'll talk to you Very later. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for your time. Thank you.